Um, Max asks in his invitation also about our personal aesthetics. I'm not gonna talk about them. I don't find it particularly interesting for our purposes here. Um, personally like strange poems, but that's another thing. Now, when I was first reading Max's invitation and his questions to us, my first impulse was to formulate in detail why I don't think one should take too seriously his question about our own strategies and approaches towards the political role of writers and literature in society. Why? Firstly, because it is only accidentally that our artistic choices and our individual behavior as participants of, let's say, the art world have any impact on that market and thus on society at large. Secondly, if there is such an impact, it will only by chance be the one we intended. And furthermore, thirdly, by being professional <laughs> writers already, we have to one degree or another internalized the values and behavioral patterns of this particular auxiliary part of the broader entertainment industry. I see only two useful strategies and approaches regarding politics for writers, but neither of them has anything to do with our personal aesthetics or our individual behavior in the market. Um, both are also, let's say, rather impractical. One is addressed exclusively to those of us who supply the simulation of public discourse that the news media has become. To not make a, even the slightest mistake ever concerning research and rhetoric and never resort to formulaic jargon that would replace thought so that the influence of bullshit and plain wrong thinking is minimalized in the long run. The other strategy is for writers of so-called fine literature and would consist of us collectively to exit the current publishing industry, to stop being competitors and entrepreneurs, and to create collectively owned publishing houses that do not pay royalties and advances, but that employ their writers and other stuff equally. So that that which sells on the so-called free market pays for that which does not. Well, yes, my books sell badly, why do you ask? Both propositions are, as I already stated, rather impractical because of that. I think it is a better use of our time here to instead talk about how the markets change and with them the aesthetics and with those the political roles of text and of writer. That is, what conditions in the society around us should we wish for and why. For one example, to ferment discussion later on, I could present to you the change in the Austrian publishing industry between 1985 and now in a very short version of this. Uh, Whereas our contemporary writing is part of and informed by the German language literature, a more or less unified canon with two or three anti-canones. Is the word canon in English the same as in German? Yes, yeah. With two or three anti-canones, 30 years ago it was part of and informed by the East German, West German, Swiss or Austrian tradition, each with their different aesthetics, audiences, institutional fixtures and of special interest for us, with different political roles for writer and for text. I do not know if this unification is a direct effect of the greater unification of the Germanies, or if it would happen, have happened anyway, part of the interna internationalization of the big English language publishing houses. Regardless, the conglomerates that we have now, by their very existence, destroyed even the possibility for there to be distinctly German, Swiss, or Austrian literatures other than counterfactual folksy dialect writing. On the transformed market, the smaller publishers need themselves to either grow, find a stable niche, or stop being economically viable. The existence of these conglomerates also tends to change the nature of the competition into something more akin to the winner-take-all model. It is no coincidence that the Anglo-American system of literary agents begins to take hold, as well as the creative writing courses in Leipzig, Hildesheim, and Vienna, where students not only learn to write, but also by osmosis how to effectively behave on a market. All this just goes to show that it is a different field than it was. Now, I would propose that if you compare the traditions or canones that preceded this unified literary German language Reich. Paradoxically, the more experimental, indirect, stagecraft-oriented, poetic and dirty approach of the 
Austrian, among those four bygone traditions, had more discursive impact in its surrounding society than the more direct, narrative, earnest Western German one. A little unprecisely, if pointedly, I would also like to propose that both the particular non-narrative aesthetics and the social influence of this literature could be plausibly derived from the role and the inner workings of the public broadcasting monopolist ORF then. That is because of two unrelated things the ORF has always been doing. On the one hand, it was very active in reviving after the World War the distinctive Austrian arts of representative theater and subversive cabaret, and in keeping them alive as a frame of reference for the populace. This became increasingly a hollow and compulsory exercise, but it never completely stopped. On the other hand, the ORF, television as well as radio, was an effective way for the official Austria to sponsor artists and writers, give them assignments for audio plays, broadcast a poetry lecture, and so on. In this way, a good portion of two generations of Austrian writers had a working environment with the following constants. A, representational theater and self-deprecating subversive cabaret as the natural popular frames of reference for, audi uh, for audiences and sponsoring officials. B, relative creative freedom inside the institution. C, more calculable income from stage and broadcast than from book sales. D, an official Austria that takes any criticism in good humor as long as the, tra as the traditional formal aspects are not touched. You could say what you want in the subtext, but not in the text, which all together translates to E, a superposition of the images and roles of the critical public intellectual, the self-deprecating fool of the coverage stage, and the writer of experimental literature. This mixture, to me, seems to have been more politically useful than what we have now. But at the same time, both states of affairs have not been brought about by calculated strategies and approaches of writers and artists, but rather as part of greater changes in power structures and social climate. I would therefore argue, again, that politically our personal aesthetics do not matter so very much, and we should act strategically and politically not as writers, but as citizens. I am cor if I am correct in assuming that the regional state-run monopolist ORF was more useful than international private monopolists like Random House, that would mean more specifically for us that we should act as citizens who want all the stuff to be nationalized and or collectivized and or democratized. Thank you very much.